What is the greatest fuck it? I'll do it myself in history. Donald Nuth is one of the big names in computer science. Back in the 1960s he set out to write the definitive texts on computer programming and analysis of algorithms. The first three volumes came out, and he started the fourth in the early slash mid 1970s. He was unhappy with how the newer printing slash editions were typeset, and so he took a summer to solve that problem. A decade later the fourth volume still had not been completed, but as a consolation prize we got TX, later extended to the more commonly used LaTeX, without question the most comprehensive and powerful language for creating documents with heavy technical requirements, it is a strange mix of a markup language like HTML and a compiled language like C it is completely free, and has been for well over 30 years and is probably the most bug free piece of software I've ever seen. Certainly for its size and scope, there's not much out there of comparable quality point there is literally no mathematics that cannot be properly typeset in text slash latex. Its default style is instantly recognizable to any working mathematician. It is used across nearly all STEM fields and there are hundreds, if not thousands, of journals that only accept manuscripts written in latex point it wasn't until the early 2000s that drafts of the fourth volume started to appear. Nobody has seemed to mind. Canadian soldier Leo Major and his friend Willy Arsenault were scouting a Dutch town called Zwaal that had been captured by Germans in WW2. On this scouting trip, the two had decided to liberate Zwaal together, but were spotted and Arsenault was killed. Major, enraged, killed two Germans, while the rest fled. On the outskirts of the town, Major intercepted a vehicle, disarming the soldiers there. He told a French-speaking soldier that all the Canadian artillery would be firing on the town in the morning, and decidedly let the Nazi free to spread the rumor, even returning his weapon as a total alpha move point that night, Major decided to single-handedly liberate the town. Arming himself with many weapons, he made explosions and noise, making it sound like the entire Canadian army was there. Several times that night, Major went back and forth from Zwaal to the Canadian base taking 8 to 10 German prisoners each time point at one point, Major located the Gestapo, high-ranking Nazis, headquarters and raided it himself. He killed several SS officers and the rest fled. By morning, Major discovered that the Germans who had taken Zwaal had entirely retreated point I should also mention that Major was a sniper who had only one eye from a phosphorus grenade explosion years prior and remained in the military because he insisted he only needed one eye to aim his weapon and that to him, he looked like a pirate point the Dutch town of Zwaal was liberated by a one-eyed sniper. He has several other legendary acts, but this to me was his best point edit. Some details, including the return of an Nazi's weapon. Damn, I just did some more eating on this guy. He also was in the Normandy invasion on D-Day and single-handedly captured an armored German vehicle that contained communication equipment and codes. After he lost his eye, but before this incident, the Smitherfica single-handedly captured 100 German soldiers. He started with one, killed the soldier's friend, then used his prisoner to force their commanding officer to surrender. As he was leading a group of his prisoners back to the Canadian front lines, SS spotted him and opened fire. Major gave zero facts and continued on his merry way, dropped the first group off, ordered a tank to go kill the SS guys then, after they got killed he personally marched the rest of his nearly 100 prisoners back to camp point Y. He was frozen and wet when he saw the first two soldiers and wanted them to pay. A general tried to give him the Distinguished Conduct Medal for this, and Major refused, because said general was incompetent and in no position to be giving medals. Shortly after he survived a landmine, and guys, this is still before Zwaal. As if his balls weren't big enough already, after WW2 he returned to fight in the Korean War, and receives another Distinguished Conduct Medal. While the Canadian forces were trying to capture a hill the Chinese currently was defending, Major led 18 men as an elite sniper slash scout force to a hill in the middle of the Chinese forces and opened fire. His team were able to take the hill. A couple hours late, 14,000 Chinese reinforcement returned to take back the hill. Major refused, found cover for his men, and was able to hold back the Chinese through the night. Point I vote for Major for most bad as Canadian by a landslide. 
the whole story behind this period of English history is really interesting, actually point basically one king, Edward the Confessor, died and there was no obvious successor. There were four options, Harold Godwinson, king's brother-in-law and powerful popular nobleman, Harold Hardrada, Norse king and distant cousin, a nephew whose name I can't remember, a child, or William the Bastard, Duke of Normandy, claimed the throne was promised to him by the dead king. The Council of Lords sat down and decided that Harold Godwinson was the best choice, and he was crowned basically immediately. This annoyed William and Harold. Point William started getting an army together, and Harold basically had to call up everyone he could into military service to fend off the invasion. Harold made his best guess about when and where the Normans would invade, but obviously it's not that simple and his army was sitting around at the ready, on high alert for weeks and weeks. Finally, it hit the point that he couldn't keep the army together anymore, and they basically disbanded point the Vikings, led by Harold Hardrada, took this moment to invade England in the north. They sailed in, marched for a bit, and then set up camp. Harold Godwinson scrambled his army back together and marched, marched. Cavalry was not a thing in England at this time, 185 miles in four days to get to Stamford Bridge, where they discovered the Vikings chilling, because there was no way that the English could arrive from the south for at least a week or two. Then the Battle of Stamford Bridge happened, the English won in a resounding victory, and Harold received news that William the Bastard had landed at Hastings. So he turned his army around and marched them back to the south. Three weeks later, Harold Godwinson faced William of Normandy at a little hill called Battle. William the Bastard became William the Conqueror, and the rest is history. Herbert Hoover biographical book review its late star codex's whole life is a cyclical story of, here's a problem. Nobody can solve it. Give me total control. He then takes total control, offends literally everyone involved, and fixes everything point you probably remember Herbert Hoover as the guy who bungled the Great Depression. Maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you should remember him as a bold explorer looking for silver in the jungles of Burma. Or as the heroic defender of teens enduring the Boxer Rebellion. Or as a dashing pirate philanthropist, gallivanting around the world, saving millions of lives wherever he went. Or as the temporary dictator of Europe. Or as a geologist, or a bank tycoon, or author of the premier 1900s textbook on metallurgy. Point how did a backwards orphan son of a blacksmith, dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Midwest, grow up to be a captain of industry and a US president? How did he become such a towering figure in the history of philanthropy that biographer Kenneth White claims the number of lives Hoover saved through his various humanitarian campaigns might exceed 100 million, a record of benevolence unlike anything in human history. To find out, I picked up White's Hoover, An Extraordinary Life in Extraordinary Times. Edit, just one of the hilarious summary snippets of his life, Herbert Hoover is the first student at Stanford. Not just a member of the first graduating class. Literally the first student. He arrives at the dorms two months early to get a head start on various money-making schemes, including distributing newspapers, delivering laundry, tending livestock, and helping other students register. He would later sell some of these businesses to other students and start more, operating a constant churn of enterprises throughout his college career. His academics remain mediocre, and he continues to have few friends, until he tries out for the football team in sophomore year. He has zero athletic talent and fails miserably, but the coach, whose eye for talent apparently transcends athletics, spots potential in Hoover, and asks him to come on as team manager. In this role, Hoover is an unqualified success. He turns the team's debt into a surplus, and starts the big game, a Ruck Berkeley vs. Stanford football match played on Thanksgiving which remains a beloved Stanford football tradition. Point other Stanford students notice his competence, and by his senior year he is running, not just the football team, but the baseball team, a lecture series, a set of concerts and plays, and much of the student government. Clarence B. Craft, Medal of Honor winner in WWII. His citation reads, 
he was a rifleman, when his platoon spearheaded an attack on Hen Hill, the tactical position on which the entire Nahashuri Yanaburu line of Japanese defense on Okinawa, Ryukai Islands, was hinged. Point for 12 days our forces had been stalled and repeated heavy assault by one battalion, and then another had been thrown back by the enemy with serious casualties. With five comrades, PFC, Kraft was dispatched in advance of Company G to fill out the enemy resistance. The group had proceeded only a short distance up the slope when rifle and Nachinigan fire, coupled with a terrific barrage of grenades, wounded three and pinned down the others against odds that appeared suicidal. PFC. Kraft launched a remarkable one-man attack. He stood up in full view of the enemy and began shooting with deadly marksmanship wherever he saw a hostile movement. He steadily advanced up the hill, killing Japanese soldiers with rapid fire, driving others to cover in their strongly disposed trenches, unhesitatingly facing alone the strength that had previously beaten back attacks in battalion strength point he reached the crest of the hill where he stood, silhouetted against the sky, while quickly throwing grenades at extremely short range into the enemy positions. His extraordinary assault lifted the pressure from his company for the moment, allowing members of his platoon to comply with his motions, to advance and pass him more grenades with a chain of his comrades supplying him. While he stood atop the hill, he furiously hurled a total of two cases of grenades into a main trench and other positions on the reverse slope of Hen Hill, meanwhile directing the aim of his fellow soldiers who threw grenades from the slope below him. He left his position, where grenades from both sides were passing over his head and bursting on either slope to attack the main enemy trench as confusion and panic seized the defenders straddling the excavation. He pumped rifle fire into the Japanese at point-blank range, killing many and causing the others to flee down the trench. Pursuing them, he came upon a heavy machinigan which was still creating havoc in the American ranks. With rifle fire and a grenade he wiped out this position. By this time the Japanese were in complete rout, and American forces were swarming over the hill. PFC. Kraft continued down the central trench to the mouth of a cave, where many of the enemy had taken cover. A satchel charge was brought to him, and he tossed it into the cave. It failed to explode. With great daring, the intrepid fighter retrieved the charge from the cave, relighted the fuse, and threw it back, sealing up the Japs in a tomb. In the local action, against tremendously superior forces heavily armed with rifles, machinigans, mortars, and grenades, PFC, Kraft killed at least 25 of the enemy, but his contribution to the campaign on Okinawa was of much more far-reaching consequence for Henhill was the key to the entire defense line, which rapidly crumbled after his utterly fearless and heroic attack. Everyone has hit on the popular ones, the less popular ones, and the ones you will only find after your third hour of a very focused Wikipedia spelunking point I will share one you can't find anywhere, because he is not a notable figure in a grander history. He is just my uncle. The roughest son of a beach I have ever known. His moments of stubbornness, harsh individualism, and even creativity, are talked about in the family as fun anecdotes, but growing up they were a mythology to me. When we moved to a new state, my uncle let me and my mom stay with him for some time. He had a number of strange things going on. His dog that connected the name to the feeling of flooring surfaces and could be told exactly where to stand. The ant hill was in the driveway that sometimes left a horrific spackling of black limbs and bodice for the morning. The unusual found out of a homestead a personality, trinkets found pictures and bits of glass at this point in time, my uncle had two major burdens. Alcoholism and a mouth full of rotting teeth. He would drink to ease the pain and it would transform him into the biggest asshole I ever knew. He wasn't abusive, he just wouldn't shut the fuck up. Eventually self-medicating with the booze wasn't effective anymore and he saw a dentist. It's got to be bad if he's seeing a professional point he wanted all of his teeth pulled and dentures in their place. The dentist said my uncle still had a few healthy teeth, that dentures wouldn't be the best option for him. They offered to pull those beyond hope, but that would be all. He was too stubborn for that answer. His teeth, rotten, failing, or functional, had all betrayed him as far as he was concerned. And he was not going to be a man with half a set of teeth. If that point that night, after I had gone to sleep, my uncle sat at the kitchen table armed with a bottle of whiskey and his Leatherman pliers. He drank himself numb and proceeded to pry the teeth out of his own mouth. 
My mom was ready with the rags, iodine, and cotton balls. She expected screams. Maybe an ambulance point no. She said my uncle made quick work of it, cried in relief, and slept soundly with a mouthful of paper towels. I saw the aftermath of a stained kitchen table, but that was all point he got his dentures. And I don't think it's any coincidence that he chose sobriety shortly after. Admiral Yi Sunshin of Korea Point. When the Japanese launched their first invasion of Korea, the Korean kingdom was not prepared. Hideyoshi's fleet just basically got free passage despite Korea's better navy at the time, because the guy in charge took one look at a bunch of transports that went all Leroy Jenkins and thought, oh shit, scuttle our entire faking fleet, we have no chance, enter. Admiral Yi Sunshin who invented a new type of ship called the Turtle Dragon ship that had a spiked roof, tons of cannons, oh and it could spew faking fire. He took his one turtle ship and a bunch of refitted fishing boats and kept destroying the Japanese navy in battle after battle despite being horribly outnumbered. Oh and he did this without ever losing a single Fakine ship. Not even once, by this time the Korean kingdom was like good on you Admiral Yi. And he got a bunch more turtle dragon ships and proceeded to fack up the Japanese navy some more, which faked with the army supplies, which stalled the complete takeover of Korea. Now there were some assholes in the king's court who really did not like Yi Sunshin, despite the fact that he saved the Korean kingdom from annihilation. So they made up some sheet and got Yi Sunshin charged with treason, and he was sentenced to die. Point meanwhile, remember that idiot that scuttled the entire fleet last time before Yi Sunshin decided to do sheet himself? They fack and put him in charge of the navy again. And do you know what he did when he saw the Japanese navy reinforcement? He ordered all the Fakine ships, even the Turtle Dragons, destroyed and ran for the Fakine Hills again, so the king knows he faked up and halts the execution of his one competent military leader. The king apologizes and says there's no way to win cause now they have only 12 refitted fishing boats and no Turtle Dragon ships. Yi Sunshin replies, hold the fack up. We still have 12 ships. I'll lead them and fack the Japanese navy up again and... The crazy Matherfica stuck to his word. He faked up the navy so badly that Hideyoshi's son, who took over when his dad died in the middle of the campaign, called off the invasion and told everyone to go home point, but Yi Sunshin wanted to go all John Wick on the Japanese. He wasn't about to let the Japanese go home so easily. So with some brand new ships and the aid of the Chinese Tang Dynasty he went after the fakers who invaded his beloved country point unfortunately the Tang Admiral decided to go all Leroy Jenkins and charge the navy, which faked over Yi Sunshin's strategy. Admiral Yi was all like, ah sheet. Okay everyone charge in. Let's give our idiot friends a helping hand. During the final battle Admiral Yi was shot by a stray musket bullet. As he lay dying he told his son to wear his armor and pretend to be him until the battle was over. The Japanese navy was pulverized again and most of them never made it back home point and that is the true story of how one faking awesome admiral basically single handedly saved his kingdom despite being faked over by them. Taken from the last time this question was asked point to him I apologize for the formatting errors if present, Joan. Of arc's entire career was a giant fuck it, I'll do it myself point she had no military experience, she had no money, and she was only in her mid-teens. But her country was losing a war, and so fuck it point she talked her way into a meeting with the king, talked her way into a sword and a suit of armor and a horse, and talked her way into permission to travel with a supply train. When she got to the siege the guys who were actually running the siege treated her like a mascot, but fuck it point she crashed war meetings where she hadn't been invited and pretty much told everybody to go fuck themselves. Then went off to lead soldiers into battle. Strangely enough, the soldiers followed her. Even more strangely, they started capturing towers. Then she got shot in the shoulder with a crossbow bolt. It was just about the same wound that had killed Richard the Lion her two centuries earlier, but once again fuck it point she pulled the bolt out with her own hands. Which isn't exactly the smart thing to do with puncture wounds but fuck it. She grabbed a banner and rallied the next charge, which was a pretty damn good thing because that was about the time the enemy army decided to give up the siege. She could have rested up and gone home at that point. After all she pretty much only had one usable arm at that point, but fuck it point she started capturing more strongholds. 
After a particularly lopsided battle called the Battle of Pate the enemy army was decimated. So she led her king on a march to get a proper coronation, but there were a lot of towns under enemy control along the way. This could pose a problem, but fuck it point that string of towns switched without a fight. Because, fuck, she had the whole army with her. Then there was no formal role for a peasant girl from the middle of nowhere at a royal coronation, but fuck it point she stood beside the king holding her banner while he got crowned. Now as an example of exactly what bad shape things were generally for France at that point, Paris was behind enemy lines. Once again, fuck it point she attacked Paris. And once again got shot, this time in the leg. She refused to leave the field and kept directing troops. At about this time the political scene at court started turning against her because she was getting far too powerful, far too fast, and she was chronically insubordinate. She didn't get the chance to lead the main army again, but fuck it point she kept leading small forces. Because this was the feudal era and troops were loyal to a particular lord, not like modern military structure. So there were noblemen who respected her accomplishments enough that they invited her to command the troops under them. How she figured out tactics so fast without any experience is kind of a mystery, but a lot of it seems to be that she was aggressive and pushed an advantage at a time when the norm had been demoralized and timid. They also said she had an knack for artillery placement, artillery being mostly crossbows and really primitive muzzle loading proto cannons. Without the main army there wasn't a whole lot to work with, but fuck it. After a few more small battles she got captured fact point she did her level best to escape and nearly broke free because fact it point you probably heard about the rest, a kangaroo court trial where she sparred with her judges verbally every day. Several transcripts survive where she threatened her judges to fear for their souls. All of them were learned churchmen including a bishop, but fuck it. And guess who's the only person from that courtroom who got made a saint? Sources. HTTPS. Slash slash sourcebooks point fordham point edu. Sergeant Daryl Samuel Cole, the man they named the USN destroyer after, entered the Marines as a bugler. He repeatedly requested to be a gunner. It finally happened, and he showed his worth on Iwo Jima. On February 19th, Sergeant Cole led his machine gun section ashore in the D-Day assault of Iwo Jima. Moving forward with the initial assault wave, a hail of fire from two enemy emplacements halted his section's advance. Sergeant Cole personally destroyed them with hand grenades. His unit continued to advance until pinned down for a second time by enemy fire from three Japanese gun emplacements. One of these emplacements was destroyed by a machine gunner in Cole's squad. When his machine guns jammed, armed only with a pistol and one hand grenade, Sergeant Cole made a one-man attack against the two remaining gun emplacements. Twice he returned to his own lines for additional grenades and continued the attack under fierce enemy fire until he had succeeded in destroying the enemy strong points. One upon returning to his own squad, he was killed by an enemy grenade. As a result of his one-man attack, Sergeant Cole's company could move forward against the fortifications and attain their ultimate objective. One Sergeant Cole was initially buried in the 4th Marine Division Cemetery on Iwo Jima, but at the request of his father, his remains were returned to the United States to be buried in Parkview Cemetery, Farmington, Missouri. 4. Dashrath Manji was a common laborer in the Indian state of Bihar, whose wife died after an accident at work because of no medical attention. The nearest hospital to his village was about 5 to 7 kilometers, but there was a hill that prevented direct pathing. Going around the hill meant the hospital was almost 50 kilometers from his village point to make sure no other person from his village would suffer such a fate. He pleaded the government and local bodies to cut a path through. This plea was met with crude and sarcastic remarks, one of which was, if you care so much, why don't you do it yourself? He took this insult to heart and set to work on what was seemingly an impossible task point with just a hammer and chisel bought. After selling his belongings and without proper food, Manji began chipping away at the hill after his day's work as a laborer. He shifted his house to the basement of the hill to the ridicule of the villagers. Over time, the ridicule turned into admiration and help in the form of food and necessities he split open the hill over a course of 22 years all by himself with just a hammer and chisel and created a path about 16 feet wide. 
his indomitable spirit and the love he had for his wife helped him achieve this Herculean task which cut short the distance to nearest hospital from 50 kilometers to a mere 8 kilometers. His story was not popular in India before a movie about him titled Manji, The Mountain Man was released in 2015 and his heroics came into spotlight, well after he died in 2007. How the prisoners of Sabibha concentration camp escaped point unlike many other Nazi concentration camps, Sabibha existed for the sole purpose of exterminating Jews. Most new arrivals were immediately sent to the gas chambers, with rare exceptions being made for those who were forced to serve as slave laborers who assisted in the operation of the camp. Some 200,000 to 250, comma, 000, left square bracket 3, people were murdered at Sobaba, 4, making it the fourth deadliest extermination camp after Belzec, Treblinka, and Auschwitz. Sobiba is notable for the prisoner revolt which occurred on the 14th of October 1943, an event which is often described as the most successful revolt ever to have taken place in an Nazi extermination camp. The plan for the revolt, which was developed by Alexander Pechersky and Leon Feldhendler, involved two phases. In the first phase, teams of prisoners were to assassinate all of the on-duty SS officers in discrete locations. In the second phase, all 600 prisoners would assemble for roll call and walk to freedom out the front gate. However, the revolt did not go as planned. The operation was discovered, while several SS officers were still alive and prisoners ended up having to escape by climbing over barbed wire fences and running through a minefield under heavy machine gun fire. Even so, about 300 prisoners made it out of the camp, of whom roughly 60 survived to the end of the war. Late to the thread and this is significantly less important than some of the other answers. But one of my favorite examples of this. Let me give some background. In 2012, the biggest question in sports was where is Peyton Manning going to sign? Those of you who don't follow football have surely heard of Peyton, even if it's just from SNL or the nationwide commercials. Manning was just coming off a major injury and many questioned if he would return to form, but that did not stop half the league from chasing after him. He eventually signed with the Denver Broncos in a huge move that would result in an incredible next five years I promise that I'm getting to the point point Manning famously wore 18 in honor of his brother who could not play football due to a life-threatening pre-existing spinal condition. For the previous 13 years, the number 18 was synonymous with Pete and Manning and many were looking forward to seeing him wear 18 in orange and blue. One problem, 18 was one of only three numbers retired by the Broncos. Sports teams frequently retire numbers and some NFL teams have a crazy amount of them retired points so which player was important enough in Denver Broncos history to be only one of three number retirees, Frank Tripucker. That's right. Frank Moth the faking Tripucker. Even D had sports fans were scratching their heads when this came up during the courting of Manning and the off-season point Frank Tripucker was a quarterbacks coach for the Broncos in the first year of the franchise's history when they were still an AFL team. He had been a journeyman slash backup player in the NFL and other smaller professional football leagues before retiring and starting coaching. Like you can probably imagine, the Broncos were struggling early on. But the quarterback position was a huge struggle like many other young franchises. Tripaka spent the offseason trying to get the quarterbacks on the roster up to speed before saying fuck it. Where are my pads? That's right. Frank Tripaka. The quarterbacks coach threw pads on and played because his guys weren't up to paragraph. Now, you might be thinking surely this guy didn't do well and was benched a game or two in, you would be wrong. Tripaka started all 14 games in the Broncos inaugural season. While he threw a boatload of interceptions compared to the modern game, this was typical at the time, he threw for 3,000 yards, an AFL and NFL first, and has the distinction of throwing the first touchdown pass in AFL history. Point Tripaka went on to be the Broncos starting quarterback for two more years before retiring. The Broncos subsequently retired his number. 18 point this isn't the end of the story. Frank was such a cool guy that when he heard Manning was planning on wearing 16 for the Broncos, Manning is a student of the game and knew who Frank was, because of course he did, Frank called Manning personally and begged him to wear 18. 
Peyton did, and led the Broncos to five incredible seasons, which included four AFC Championship games, a near sweep of division opponents year in and out, a new NFL record four points, passing yards, and touchdowns in a season, two Super Bowl appearances, and ended with a Super Bowl win to end his career. Tripucker unfortunately passed away before the Broncos won Super Bowl 50 in Manning's last year, but he did get to watch one of the best quarterbacks pay homage to him with two of the greatest seasons ever by an NFL quarterback. Point when Manning retired, the Broncos instantly re retired Tripucker's 18. It's such a cool story to me, a fan of the franchise, that this legendary player who was part of the Denver community saw additional recognition and awareness of his accomplishments, while making an incredible gesture to one of the greatest players of all time. Point Rip Frank Tripucker. Evan O'Neill Kane, a Pennsylvania physician and surgeon, wanted to prove the effectiveness of local anesthetic. He believed that ever, the substance commonly used for general anesthetic at the time, was unnecessarily dangerous, and that Novocaine, the newly created, safer alternative to cocaine, was a viable option, especially in cases where general anesthetic was not possible. So in 1921, to demonstrate the usefulness of Novocaine, he used it to perform an appendectomy, while keeping the patient fully conscious. However, partly because he wanted to experience the patient's perspective of the surgery, and partly because no one wanted to have their appendix removed while conscious, he performed the operation on himself. It was a success, and he was well enough to go home the next day. He became a sensation, with the surgery being reported for several years afterwards then in 1932 he did it again. At the age of 70 no less. He repaired his own hernia, while being watched by the press and a photographer. This procedure is even more dangerous than the appendectomy, due to the added risk of puncturing the femoral artery and bleeding out. The procedure lasted 1 hour, 55 minutes, and he was back on his feet, and working again 36 hours later this man was faking unstoppable point he also tattooed the letter K in Morse code inside every patient he operated on. That Midway movie was horribly cheesy, and I cringed every 30 seconds watching it but I digress. Richard Dick Best literally, single-handedly changed the course of the Pacific Theater in WW2 point during the Battle of Midway on June 4, 1942. Best's group of planes were following his leaders, Wade McCluskey, group when they came across the main body of the Japanese fleet. Aircraft carriers were the primary target, the top of the Navy's kill list, and in front of them were two, the Kaga right below them, and the Akaji about a mile or two away. This all happened in less than five minutes the plan was for one squadron, Bests, to dive bomb on the closer ship right below them, the Kaga, while the other squadron, McCluskey's, was to hit the Akaji which was farther away point well things got interesting pretty quickly. Many of these young 20 to 22 year old boys were so excited to fly straight down from 15,000 feet and plant their bombs onto the ships, which had bombed Pearl Harbor, and killed many of their friends. They didn't realize both squadrons, all 30 planes were diving on the Kaga at once. There were almost a few mid-air collisions, because several of McCluskey's planes dove at angles over 90 degrees, right in front of Best Squadron Point Dick Best was without a doubt the best dive bomber pilot in the business. He saw that all of his comrades were dropping on the same ship, the Kaga, so he pulled out of his dive to go hit the Akaji. Luckily his two wingmates noticed him pulling up and followed best one on each side. So we had 27 planes, I think, dropping down to absolutely obliterate the Kaga, and only three planes going after the Akaji, the flagship and the home of the Japanese Navy's best torpedo bomber squadron. All experienced veterans with top marks amongst their peers. These guys were the A-team of Japan's WWII Naval Aviation Point so, if Best and his two wingmen missed, Akaji would have been able to launch this torpedo squadron and almost certainly would have scored a hit on the US carrier's Enterprise and or Hornet, both undamaged on this day. Both of Best's swingman's bombs hit the water, one in front and the other in the rear of the Akaji point Best put his 1000 pound bomb smack in the middle point like a JDAM, it penetrated several decks before exploding, starting uncontrollable fires which spread, and eventually started detonating Akaji's planes and bombs in her hangar, if Dick Best had missed, it is unknown how much longer the war would have lasted, and how many more lives cold been lost.
the Guadalcanal campaign would not have happened so quickly, or even at all, if there were no experienced US carriers to support it. Point now, I'm not saying Japan World won the war, but we may have lost another 100,000 men. If Japan had been given a six or seven month break from the only US Navy units that could effectively engage and destroy the Japanese Navy. Plus just the fact the US sank four Japanese carriers on that June 4th helped out tremendously in future operations though, and our friend Dick Best also dive-bombed and hit a second aircraft carrier, Hiryu, later that same day, because he was a fucking badass. Best and Norman Dusty Cleese the only men in history to do so point, but unlike that damn movie, they were flying probably closer 400 to 500 miles per hour when they released bombs instead of 65. Edward Allen Carter Jr. was an African-American recipient of the Medal of Honor in WW2 with the US Army. He also served in the Chinese Army fighting against Japan early on in the war as well as in the Spanish Civil War. Before joining the fight for the US Point Staff Sergeant Carter volunteered to lead a three-man patrol to the warehouse where other unit members noticed bazooka fire. From here they too were ascertained the location and strength of the opposing position and advance approximately 150 yards across an open field. Enemy small arms fire covered this field. As the patrol left this covered position, they received intense enemy small arms fire killing one member of the patrol instantly. This caused Staff Sergeant Carter to order the other two members of the patrol to return to the covered position and cover him with rifle fire while he proceeded alone to carry out the mission. The enemy fire killed one of the two soldiers while they were returning to the covered position and seriously wounded the remaining soldier before he reached the covered position. An enemy machine machine gun burst wounded Staff Sergeant Carter three times in the left arm as he continued the advance. He continued and received another wound in his left leg that knocked him from his feet. As Staff Sergeant Carter took wound tablets and drank from his canteen, the enemy shot it from his left hand, with the bullet going through his hand. Disregarding these wounds, Staff Sergeant Carter continued the advance by crawling until he was within 30 yards of his objective. The enemy fire became so heavy that Staff Sergeant Carter took cover behind a bank and remained there for approximately two hours. Eight enemy riflemen approached Staff Sergeant Carter, apparently to take him prisoner. Staff Sergeant Carter killed six of the enemy soldiers and captured the remaining two. These two enemy soldiers later gave valuable information concerning the number and disposition of enemy troops. Staff Sergeant Carter refused a medical evacuation until he had given full information about what he had observed and learned from the captured enemy soldiers who he interrogated in German the entire way back to his command. Reginald Fessenden, Canadian inventor, later moved to the US for financial reasons, saw this wonderful thing that Sir William Bell had done to transmit the sound of voice over long distance over wires and declared, at age 9, that sound should be transmitted over the air. Years later started a company and invented radio. Was able to make the first cross-ocean radio broadcast before his towers collapsed. Then became the world's first DJ, by airing not the dot 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 of Marconi, but the first public radio transmission Christmas Eve, 1906, where he played the violin and read from a book and broadcast to ships in the South Atlantic. Westinghouse complained about fires in his factories. Reginald took his chemical studies and invented PVC wiring which we use today. Crafted some patents for Edison, some patents for TV and other radio inventions and realized too late for the Titanic, that is radio waves could be used in the water. Created sonar and depth finder, which the US Navy used for submarines and all sea vessels began using. While trying to secure more investors, Westinghouse corrupted the board of his company which sold all of Fessenden's patents at the time to which Westinghouse created a new company with these patents, RCA. RCA eventually settled with Fessenden years later. He had over 800 patents in communication, energy, radio, engine design and a multitude of other types. Never got the recognition he deserved, all because he thought sound should travel over the air. Robert Gibbon Johnson. Up until the early 1800s tomatoes were considered deadly poison, for several reasons. Foremost was that early on. People ate tomatoes off of pewter plates that had a high concentration of lead, and the acid leached the lead and killed people, only no one knew about the lead thing, just though it was tomatoes. 
Also, tomatoes are in the same family as Deadly Nightshade. Then, Colonel Johnson announced that he would eat a tomato, also called the Wolf Peach, Jerusalem Apple or Love Apple, on the steps of the county courthouse at noon. That morning, in 1820, about 2,000 people were jammed into the town square. The spectators began to hoot and jeer. Then, 15 minutes later, Colonel Johnson emerged from his mansion and headed up Market Street towards the courthouse. The crowd cheered. The fireman's band struck up a lively tune. He was a very impressive looking man as he walked along the street. He was dressed in his usual black suit with white ruffles, black shoes and gloves, trickhorn hat, and cane. At the courthouse steps he spoke to the crowd about the history of the tomato. He picked a choice one from a basket on the steps and held it up so that it glistened in the sun. To help dispel the tall tales, the fantastic fables that you have been hearing. And to prove to you that it is not poisonous I'm going to eat one right now. There was not a sound as the colonel dramatically brought the tomato to his lips and took a bite. A woman in the crowd screamed and fainted but no one paid her any attention. They were all watching colonel. Johnson as he took one bite after another. He raised both his arms and again bit into one and then the other. The crowd cheered and the fireman's band blared a song. He's done it, they shouted. He's still alive. The story of Robert Gibbon Johnson and the Tomato. Salem County Historical Society. Sir Charles Upham. War Office. The 14th of October. 1941 point the king has been graciously pleased to approve of awards of the Victoria Cross to the undermentioned. Second Lieutenant Charles has lit up him. 8077. New Zealand military forces during the operations in Crete this officer performed a series of remarkable exploits. Showing outstanding leadership, tactical skill and utter indifference to danger. He commanded a forward platoon in the attack on Malamy in the 22nd of May, and fought his way forward for over 3,000 yards unsupported by any other arms, and against a defense strongly organized in depth. During this operation his platoon destroyed numerous enemy posts, but on three occasions sections were temporarily held up. In the first case, under a heavy fire from a machine gun nest he advanced to close quarters with pistol and grenades, so demoralizing the occupants that his section was able to mop up with ease. Another of his sections was then held up by two machine guns in a house. He went in and placed a grenade through a window, destroying the crew of one machine gun and several others, the other machine gun being silenced by the fire of his sections. In the third case he crawled to within 15 yards of an MG post and killed the gunners with a grenade. When his company withdrew from Malim he helped to carry a wounded man out under fire and together with another officer, rallied more men together to carry other wounded men out. He was then sent to bring in a company which had become isolated. With a corporal he went through enemy territory over 600 yards, killing two Germans on the way, found the company and brought it back to the battalion's new position but for this action it would have been completely cut off. During the following two days his platoon occupied an exposed position on forward slopes and was continuously under fire. Second Lieutenant Upham was blown over by one mortar shell and painfully wounded by a piece of shrapnel behind the left shoulder by another. He disregarded this wound and remained on duty. He also received a bullet in the foot which he later removed in Egypt. At Gatlas on the 25th of May his platoon was heavily engaged and came under severe mortar and machine gun fire. While his platoon stopped under cover of a ridge second Lieutenant Upham went forward, observed the enemy, and brought the platoon forward when the Germans advanced. They killed over 40 with fire and grenades and forced the remainder to fall back. When his platoon was ordered to retire he sent it back under the platoon sergeant and he went back to warn other troops that they were being cut off. When he came out himself he was fired on by two Germans. He fell and shammed dead, then crawled into a position, and having the use of only one arm rested his rifle in the fork of a tree, and as the Germans came forward he killed them both. The second to fall actually hit the muzzle of the rifle as he fell. On the 30th of May at Sfakia his platoon was ordered to deal with a party of the enemy which had advanced down a ravine to near force headquarters. Though in an exhausted condition he climbed the steep hill to the west of the ravine, placed his men in positions on the slope overlooking the ravine and himself went to the top with a Bren gun and two riflemen. By clever tactics he induced the enemy party to expose itself and then at a range of 500 yards shot 22 and caused the remainder to disperse in panic. 
During the whole of the operations he suffered from dysentery and was able to eat very little. In addition to being wounded and bruised point he showed superb coolness, great skill and dash, and complete disregard of danger. His conduct and leadership inspired his whole platoon to fight magnificently throughout, and in fact, was an inspiration to the battalion. London Gazette, 14 October 1941, left square bracket 9. Not in history, but a personal anecdote. God defied me on this day point I worked as a contractor for a flight company that wanted to verify that an alternative light source, LEDs, would be qualified to work on landing strips. It would have saved airports thousands each year on electrical costs and improved visibility on the ground point the company I was contracted to was very poor at communicating what their needs were. So much to the point that the previous contractor quit. Said previous contractor wasn't good at his design for setting up the previous data acquisition system, DAC. Unfortunately, some poor sap jumped a fence and got himself electrocuted to death in our test area. Protocol managers at the area went snafu on bumping up security that it was damn near impossible to work on site point since the company didn't care how I got the data and no one was helping me get on site. I said fuck it, I'll do it myself and knew some people who could get me one site. FF2 months and a lot of boring details. Later, I had redesigned the entire DAC with no assistance from the company and had designed the system from the ground up to work remotely and get them all the data they wanted and more point two weeks later a thunderstorm blew out our power supply and all my work. The project was discontinued a few days later. <laughs> HTTPS slash slash endpoint m wikipedia point org slash wiki slash battle underscore of underscore elysia of battle of elysia was one of caesar's greatest military victories to start off initially the romans were vastly vastly outnumber by said gauls that had supplies a damn town to fortify and further allies coming in to aid the mere days at a waypoint so caesar says f this builds a damn wall around the town literally makes a huge no man's land with pitfalls etc etc Effectively waiting to starve the Gauls out, even though the Romans knew Gaul reinforcement were on their way. So what do the Romans do? Build another freaking wall around themselves, double walling the Gauls, and protecting the Roman encampment point all expect this one tiny funnel, because of the uneven terrain. So the Gauls allies show up, and the besieged ones ride out, to take the Romans on both sides. It's a huge slaughter from the fortified Romans and the overwhelming number of Gaul. Who realize the outlook is a way in point now being a good tactician blah blah. Lots of murder holes, pitfalls etc. Doesn't matter the backup goals have men to spare. What they weren't expecting was mother flipping Caesar himself leading a massive rear cavalry charge. It was either get impaled by arrows or pitfalls or get trampled to death. The Romans were outnumbered 4 to 1, but managed to pull off a victory all, because Caesar and his genius council said, Oh you want to hole up in a town, let me show you a proper goddamn wall, and how to properly murder your opponents. The Battle of Saragahi is probably the greatest fuck it, I'll do it myself in Indian history for sure, and perhaps all of history point it took place in the year 1897. Back in the late 1800s, the British Raj commissioned Sikh soldiers to defend the borders of present-day Pakistan against foreign invaders like Pashtuns and Afghans the story goes like this. At 9am, Sardar Gurmukh Singh signaled to a British colonel at a different fort, using mirrors mind you, that a large army of 10,000 Afghan soldiers had staged themselves right outside of the fort and were preparing to attack Point Col. Horton signaled that they will not be sending any reinforcement and ordered them to abandon the fort and let the Afghans commandeer it point the position of these two forts on the Khyber pass were of supreme strategic importance at that time and acted as a barrier from foreign invaders as the Khyber pass was literally the only way Afghans, Pashtuns and other invaders can travel through in order to get to India. Instead of abandoning the fort and allowing the Afghans to take over, Aisha Singh basically said fuck it, I'll do it myself, and ordered his 21 soldiers to defend against the 10,000 Afghans themselves. It first started as an intense gunfight, where the soldiers positioned themselves at the top of the fort to take out as many enemy combatants as possible. 
Eventually, the Afghan soldiers were too powerful in numbers and broke into the fort where each and every 21 soldier fought using in hand-to-hand -hand combat, yelling their battle cry Bolso Nihil, sat SRI Akal until each one of them perished in battle point they were martyrs for the British Raj, but their sacrifices did not go in vain, as the battle weakened the army. When they advanced to Fort Lockhart, reinforcement eventually arrived, and the army was unable to advance from that point forward. Elon Musk, when in college thought up several feats humankind would be capable of accomplishing, some that would need to accomplish immediately, to avert a global warming catastrophe. A short while later, after developing multiple companies with his brother, one of which which was sold to eBay for 1.5b and renamed PayPal, Elon saw that little progress was being made in advancing sustainable living, and near no progress in sustainable transport. So Ellen invested half of his money, 150 meters, into two companies SpaceX, 2002, and Tesla Motors, 2003, which was a small startup company at the time point struck by the growing urgency for sustainable energy, he built Tesla, a 0 to 60. Less than 5 seconds, self-driving automobile empire now worth 95 billion dollars, and titled as hash 3 best selling car in Europe, while also manufacturing solar panels and home battery pack storage systems. Ellen took on the space industry single handedly, and developed the private company which is now prompting NASA to pursue greater goals with the assistance of SpaceX technologies. All the while building a private spacecraft to travel to Mars, effectively backing up human life on a second planet point developing Neuralink, which is a promising new technology with the potential to read and write brain waves which would ultimately be a melody to brain injury and mental disease. Ellen hints at Neuralink being capable of becoming a computer brain interface that would enable a type of superhuman intelligence allowing up to at least be eligible for a ride alongside future superpower artificial intelligence point. When the companies were struggling financially in their early development, Ellen made the decision to invest the remaining balance into the companies to keep them afloat. With luck and a controversial CEO leadership these companies continue to lead humanity into the unforeseeable future with positive anticipation point definitely leaving out important milestones, but you can surely see his self-empowered accomplishments. In 1929, Dr. Forsman, in Germany, tried the first cardiac catheterization by performing the procedure on himself. Here was a very low-level doctor and the general thought in the medical community was that the heart itself was off-limits to any form of direct intervention. Dr. Forsman disagreed but no one would back any testing point he enlisted the help of a nurse and told her he would do the procedure on her. He strapped her down and proceeded to start on himself. From an incision in the crease of his elbow, he started inserting a 65 cm long ureteral tube into his arm. When he got close to his heart, they needed to get an x-ray to document the procedure. They walked, tube in his arm, to the x-ray lab, only to find it didn't have what they needed. The nurse and Dr. Forsman walked down flights of stairs to an x-ray lab in the basement point they took a picture and found the tube had not progressed far enough. So Dr. Forsman continued to push it through his vein until it reached the heart. Then there he got an x-ray which proved that they were able to get a tube into the heart point however, even after all that, the medical community did not see the promise of this procedure. Dr. Forsman continued to labor as a low-level doctor in the hospital point in 1956 his wife received a phone call at home from a foreign-speaking man wanting to talk to Dr. Forsman. They put it off as a crank call. But the person persisted, and finally Dr. Forsman talked to them, and learned he had been awarded a Nobel Prize point his technique formed the basis of modern cardiology. Tango Mike Mike Staff Sergeant Roy P. Benavides on May 2, 1968, a distress call from a 12-man Special Forces patrol comprised of three Green Berets and nine Montagnard tribesmen, alerted that over 1,000 North Vietnamese surrounded their position. Benavidez ran to the helipad to see medevac helicopters shot to pieces trying to rescue them. Armed with only a knife and medical bag, he boarded another helicopter and scorched through the sky to save his teammates. When he reached their position, every soldier had been wounded. He jumped off the skids of the helicopter and provided immediate first aid. The helicopter's pilot had been shot, but he continued to drag his wounded teammates to the bird. 
Benavidez was shot through the back, and a blast from a hand grenade peppered him with shrapnel and knocked him out. When he awoke, the helicopter was on fire. An enemy soldier slashed him in the arm with a bayonet and hit him in the jaw with his rifle. Bernadavez killed the soldier with his knife. Another helicopter came to rescue them, but was also shot down. In the six-hour firefight from hell, Bernadavez was shot seven times, had 28 fragmentation holes in his body, and rescued eight lives. When he passed out from the pain and exhaustion, doctors thought he had died. He awoke in a body bag and used his spit to alert to them he was still alive, despite his catastrophic injuries. He retired as a master sergeant and died in 1998. St. Olga of Kiev Point she was wife to the ruler of Kievan Rus, Igor I, and after his death, she became regent until her son came of age. Point her husband was murdered by the neighboring tribe of Drevlians, and they knew her son wasn't old enough to rule. So, hoping that she would become regent, which she did, they sent her a proposal to marry the man who killed her husband, Prince Mal. This is how she responded to the messengers, your proposal is pleasing to me indeed, my husband cannot rise again from the dead, but I desire to honor you tomorrow in the presence of my people. Return now to your boat and remain there with an aspect of arrogance. I shall send for you on the morrow, and you shall say, back quote we will not ride on horses, nor go on foot carry us in our boat. And you shall be carried in your boat, the next day, when the messengers spoke those words, they were taken to court, where trenches had been dug for them. Those 20 men were burned by Alga in the ground point but that's not all of it. No, Alga was just getting started point Alga then sent a message to the Drevlians that they should send their distinguished men to her in Kiev so that she might go to their prince with due honor. The Drevlians, unaware of the messenger's fate, complied. Alga commanded her men to draw them a bath. When they entered the bathhouse, her men had all the doors locked and burned the entire bathhouse down point, but there's still more point Olga sent another message to the Drevlians, this time ordering them to prepare great quantities of mead in the city where you killed my husband, that I may weep over his grave and hold a funeral feast for him. She arrived with her attendants to cry at Igor's tomb, and afterwards she sat down with the Drevlians to drink mead. When all the Drevlians were drunk, she had them all killed. Alga still wasn't done, though point after this attack, Alga began readying her army for a conflict, going to finish off any survivors the conflict went well, and within a year they laid siege to Coruscant, where her husband died, the siege lasted for a year without victory, but then Alga came up with an idea point she told them how all other Drevlian cities had surrendered, and only Thiz remained. She was hoping that they would submit to tribute. The Drevlians responded by saying that they were willing to do so, but were afraid that she would have them killed. Alga told them that all the bloodshed that had occurred so far has been enough for her, and to make her point, she asked for the smallest of tributes from them. She asked for three pigeons and sparrows from each house, and they happily obliged point that very night. The entire city of Coruscant burned, because Olga attached a piece of sulfur to the legs of the birds, set the pieces of sulfur on fire, and sent the birds back to their nests. In the cities Olga faking obliterated the entire Drevlian tribe in revenge for her husband's death. Amanda Fielding born 1943 Surgical Procedure, Trepanation Amanda Fielding is a British artist and scientific director. Fielding suffered from a condition that left her feeling exhausted and spent years looking for a reputable surgeon who would perform a technique known as trepanning. This is a procedure where a tiny portion of the skull is drilled into to allow blood to flow more easily around the brain. Eventually she gave up and at age 27 she decided to do the surgery herself. She was equipped with a dentist's electric drill operated by a foot pedal she then taped dark glasses to her face to stop the blood running into her eyes. She first made an incision with a scalpel and then drilled, dipping the drill bit in water every so often to cool it down. She lost almost a liter of blood, but she was pleased with her surgery. Over the next four hours she noticed herself rising up with a feeling of elation and relaxation. Fielding says, I went out and had steak for supper, and then I went to a party. Interesting fact, Fielding made a short cult art film entitled Backquote Heartbeat in the Brain, and is shown only to invited audiences. 
She also ran for British Parliament twice on the platform backquote trip our nation for the national health with the intention of drawing attention to the fact that its potential benefits should be scientifically investigated. It has to be Leo Major, a Canadian soldier from Montreal, Canada who has the highest level of badassery you can phantom point during the 1944 liberation campaign of the Netherlands he and his mate were closing in on the town of Zwaal, the Netherlands. They were scouts and got into a skirmish, his friend was killed, and Leo didn't like that. In fact, Leo liked it so little, he gathered guns and ammo from his slain friend and literally went to town. This bad as machine of a man went in with such fury, lobbing grenades at a rate of about 10 faculnazis per second, and spraying everything that seemed hostile with machine gun fire, that the German thought the actual, expected, invasion of Zwoll by the Allies had begun. Truth is it was just Leo Major, the wrong guy to piss off. He battled off most of the day, capturing many German soldiers, and escorting them out of town. When he got tired, he kicked down some doors of local residents and asked them for help, food or just a place to chill for a while. Point this man, on his own, liberated the town of Zwaal, which has now grown to a decent sized city, be it for Dutch standards, in my mind, this man is an absolute legend, and it puzzles me that this story has not been turned into a movie. It has everything you need. Point HTTPS slash slash www.youtube.com slash Probably not the greatest of them all here, but here's my submission, I work in a main dealership, and about two years ago a guy came in looking to sell his old car, but not to us. He wanted us to carry out one of our free vehicle health checks and presumably give him an all green check sheet to use as a sale point point let me tell you. It was far from all green. Been as it was two years ago I can't remember all of it, but the basics were brakes were below minimum and corroded all around. Bodywork was rotten with holes you could poke your finger through. Tires were basically road legal slicks. Various bodywork damage. One of the light clusters just didn't work. And then the PST resistance the engine was misfiring its tigs off. British technical term. Suffice to say he wasn't best. Pleased when he got a check sheet of red and amber to go with his sale. But this isn't the end of this story. Instead of having us do any of the work he took it away and did it himself. All of it, there was about a year in between visits or 10 months minimum and this prize turd comes rolling back into the car park point with brand new paint job. From afar it looked bad. Up close it looked even worse point side note here brake fluid is a great paint stripper. Another tech got the car this time round, but we all converged to see what had been done and to inspect the paint job further remember the rust and rot. It was still there. Just covered in filler. Not even sanded filler just absolutely pollocked. Technical term, in the holes and partiality shaped to the body work, while it was wet point the car now had a racing stripe. A faking racing stripe. But the most crooked stripe you will ever see. There was about 2 inches difference between the roof stripe and the bonnet stripe as to where they were situated. The fact the roof stripe basically started in one corner and ended in the other just complemented it point finally. The paint point we've seen rattle can jobs before. Quite literally scribbles in paint at an attempt to cover up damage to no avail but this. This was something else. I'm still not entirely sure what kind of paint it was, but it had been laid on that thick it stood up off the original paint, racing stripe, by at least 2 centimeters, and then to prepare and strip the paint below he had just poured brake fluid over it. I known it was brake fluid, because he hadn't even washed it off, before applying the paint over the fenders the paint was still soft below a semi hard shell and the runs were like sacks they were that terrible point the exhaust. I've never seen someone use bend sheet metal, to seal an exhaust before this point, but I had now. Stick welded on too, the brakes remained faked, but somehow less so. He might have had them skimmed, come to think of it, although they were below minimum thickness. Pads were still faked, though point tires were better, although a mismatch of part warns. Then the engine. We never actually figured out his intentions here, but to cure his misfire he earthed out the spark plugs to a plastic engine cover. If you don't understand what's wrong with that I hope someone can explain in the comments. At the end of it all we managed to get him to authorize a set of spark plugs and to remove that weird earthing contraption he'd set up. He did try refuse to pay for the spark plugs due to the vehicle report remaining near abysmal, but as much as we didn't want to we kept the car, until he paid, 
so he kinda had to pay point we never saw him again after that. Never figured out if he finally scrapped it or sold it point. If he did sell it, I feel sorry for whoever bought it point thanks for reading. When Nikola Tesla was studying in university, one of his physics professors showed the class a motor slash generator. They're both basically the same thing. You can feed it electricity, and it turns, or you can turn it, and it generates electricity, of the era, that worked with slash generated DC, direct current, meaning that the direction of the current, and the polarity, doesn't change. However, you can't simply run it on DC, the direction of the current must switch in order for the motor to work, and vice versa for the generator, so there's a device that switches the polarity, a commutator, which is a rotary switch, that has contacts connected to the windings of the motor, and brushes connected to the DC power supply that select the different contacts depending on the position, C. HTTPS slash slash endpoint wikipedia point org slash wiki slash commutator underscore electric for more information this has many disadvantages it's noisy inefficient and wears down with time point so tesla thought why not instead just use a power source that alternates the direction of the current periodically acker alternating current ack when he presented his idea to his professor but he told him that it was impossible and he shouldn't waste his time with it Fast forward a few years, however, and Tesla, unwilling to give up, designed exactly that, a motor without a commutator, now called brushless, because they don't have brushes, as opposed to brushed motors, which ran on two-phase ac. The two-phase bit is important, because brushless motors can't actually be run on single-phase ac, which is what people usually have at home, at least in my country, and that's what was stumbling the scientists slash engineers of the era. Nowadays, we use three-phase ACK motors everywhere, from quadcopters and electric vehicles. So yes, Tesla, the company, uses the motors invented by Tesla, the inventor, to large industrial machines. Ancient Romans practiced augury as a part of their religion, which was the art of observing the habits of various birds and deciphering omens from the behavior. During the Battle of Drapana in the First Punic War, Publius Claudius Pulcher was given command of a Roman naval fleet. With at least 120 ships and 20,000 plus men at his command Publius decided it was time to attack the Carthaginian fleet. It was tradition at the time to consult the auguries, in this case several sacred chickens on board the lead ship, so a few days before the planned attack he consulted the chickens. The process for this was simple, the chickens would be offered food in the morning as part of a sacred ceremony, if they chose to eat it would be a good omen for the Roman armada, however if they did not eat it was a sign, to hold off on attack. The first day the chickens refused to eat. The second day the chickens again refused to eat. Finally on the third day, the day the surprise attack was to take place, the chickens once again refused to eat. Publius in a fit of defiant rage, rushed to the top deck with all the chickens in tow, and shouted to his men, if they will not eat then let them drink, before throwing all the chickens into the sea. Publius rallied his men, and led them bravely into battle. The Roman fleet, was soundly defeated with nearly all of their ships being destroyed, around 20,000 men being killed or captured, and not a single recorded casualty from the enemy army. He was brought back to Rome, and tried for incompetence, and then committed suicide a few years later. Bertha Benz, wife of Carol Benz, founder of Mercedes Benz. 1888 On the 5th of August 1888, 39-year-old Bertha Benz drove from Mandine to Forsheim with her sons Richard and Eugen, 13, and 15 years old respectively, in a Model 3rd without telling her husband, and without permission of the authorities, thus becoming the first person to drive an automobile. Significant distance, though illegally. Before this historic trip, motorized drives were merely very short trials, returning to the point of origin, made with assistance of mechanics. Following wagon tracks, this pioneering tour covered a one-way distance of about 106 kilometers, 66 miles, although the ostensible purpose of the trip was to visit her mother, Bertha Benz had other motives, to prove to her husband, who had failed to adequately consider marketing his invention, that the automobile in which they both had heavily invested would become a financial success once it was shown to be useful to the general public, and to give her husband the confidence that his constructions had a future. 
she left Manheim around dawn, solving numerous problems along the way. Bertha demonstrated her significant technical capabilities on this journey. With no fuel tank and only a 4.5 liter supply of petrol in the carburetor, she had to find Ligroin, the petroleum solvent needed for the car to run. It was only available at apothecary shops, so she stopped in Weisloch at the city pharmacy to purchase the fuel. At the time, petrol and other fuels could only be bought from chemists, and so this is how the chemist in Weisloch became the first fuel station in the world. She cleaned a blocked fuel line with a hat pin and used her garter as insulation material. A blacksmith had to help mend her chain at one point. When the wooden brakes began to fail, Benz visited a cobbler to install leather, making the world's first pair of brake pads. An evaporative cooling system was employed to cool the engine, making water supply a big worry along the trip. The trio added water to their supply every time they stopped. The car's two gears were not enough to surmount uphill inclines and Eugene and Richard often had to push the vehicle up steep roads. Benz reached Forzheim somewhat after dusk, notifying her husband of her successful journey by telegram. She drove back to Manheim several days later TLDR, a mother takes her two boys on the first ever recorded road trip to prove the viability of her husband's new machine. I don't remember the names of the people involved nor the exact years this took place, but it was somewhere around the 1970 to 1980 period, Estonia and specifically northern Estonia. The Russians still spread communist propaganda as much as they could, and that included using the newly popularized television programs and radio stations. Estonia was a big mess, you did one thing wrong, or went against the USSR and you're essentially dead. Now, even if Russia monitored the majority of the things that were played on the Estonian TV channels, Finland decided to just pop up and build their TV tower so tall and mighty that the people in northern Estonia could also watch their programs. Problem was, you couldn't hear anything. Now, when Estonians received info that Finland was going to play an erotica film at 2am one night, you needed sound, and oh boy, the things they did to watch their damn adult movie. Now, I'm obviously just mentioning one of the more funnier reasons they decided to do this operation which I will talk about, but there were many others a full on mafia, started forming just to get antennas and other audio receivers, so that people could watch Finnish TV with sound. A man who was a young boy at the time, described how his father was a part of the circle providing others with the needed parts. He said that one day, my father put me into the backseat of our car and drove off, not saying a word. He drove us to Muster Moor, an area of the capital, Tallinn, and dropped me off in front of an apartment. He instructed me to go to the 4th floor and knock 8 times on the door to the 45th flat. I did as told, and a man in a robe opened and handed me a box filled with little technical objects, before quickly shutting the door. He also explained how he could never tell anybody about this, and what his dad did, because the Russians considered it as going against the communists. So basically, Estonians were tired of not knowing what the hell was going on in the outside world, they got a glimpse of it, needed more and decided to just start an entire networking system for TV parts and antennas and radios, just to watch Finnish TV. PS. I'm Estonian and translated this myself from a documentary I watched about it. I would recommend it, but it's all in Estonian. In 2020 Dr. Donald J. Trump, the 45th President of the United States against all olds, had predicted the devastation of the deadliest virus in a lifetime. His quick thinking and medical background possibly had saved one hundreds of thousands of lives. He went against his political advisors and the political elites. He decided to spend more than two billions dollars in the federal government's funds to prepare for the coronavirus which was spreading, infecting, and killing people in China. He single-handedly upgraded 80% of hospitals all over the US by shipping tens of thousands of ventilators, millions of medical PPE and force every hospitals to have contingency plans for the oncoming virus President Trump had also warned the public every day of the upcoming pandemic in his daily briefing leading up to the virus. He warned people there would be an inconvenience in their freedom as the government will be forced to pass strict laws to save lives. He warned there will be tough measures such as social distancing, they will be forced to wear a mask and mandatory lockdown point the virus had ravaged every country in the world except for the US. We watched on the news as the virus came and gone, 
but for the majority of us, we didn't realize how devastating it could have been for our country fatality and economically. Historians have estimated without President Dr. Trump's action it was estimated that more than a million people would have been infected with the death count surpassing 100,000, not to mention the economical toll. Some have estimated the unemployment rate would surpass the time of the Great Depression due to the mandatory lockdown. Today, I rolled a dice I hope nothing happen, a wee sheet. Went to buy milk at the store, left my bike out for 5 minutes. When I get back my bike was stolen I filed a police report. The policy didn't seem to care, so I take it upon myself to search for my stolen bike. I went to the stores around the crime scene request them to check the security camera footage. Even if they don't see the thief, at least I know where he didn't go I just searched by the blind spots of the security cameras an hour goes by I'm walking by the back streets of the stores, heading towards the possible direction of the thief. Within 5 minutes I see a rolder man, within his 50s, bike towards me on my bike, the disrespect. I wait for him to pass me, while keeping it cool to not arise suspicion, shortly after he passes me, I snuck up on him, charged, tried to knock him off the bike. He regained his balance, didn't fall, but was left in shock. Not gonna lie I was also spooked, because I failed to throw him off, now we were standing in front of each other. I beached at him about how it was my bike, to give it back. He started lying acting a fool, I wasn't buying it. I got pissed when I saw he removed my phone mount from the handlebars, told him to give everything back. I managed to drag his sorry as all the way to his home until he fetched the phone mount he left at his address, got everything handed back went on and the rest of my day point the cops couldn't do anything, so I pulled some detective skills, found the perpetrator took justice upon my hands, to recover my property back bring shame upon himself. Elon Musk building SpaceX, because the Russians won't give him a good deal on a rocket for his Mars project. Back in 2001 Elon had went to Russia, to buy an ICBM, to send some plants and rodents to Mars. He had a lot of money in the bank from the sale of PayPal to eBay, and wanted to do something that would inspire humanity to become a spacifering civilization by sending living organisms to another planet. He optimistically thought the whole thing could be done for a couple million dollars. At that time, the only people making rockets were Yates, and Russia had by far the cheapest ones because of the collapse of the USSR. However, the Russians knew this, so they tried to squeeze more money out of Ellen. He wanted 8 million dollars for two rockets, they offered him one for 8 million. So he began brainstorming, and figured that it wouldn't cost too much to build a rocket company, and do it himself. That was the impetus behind SpaceX. Now, almost 20 years later, SpaceX competes in the commercial space launch industry and its rockets are even cheaper than the Russians due to them being reusable while the Russians, and pretty much every other country, are still making single-use rockets. SpaceX is even preparing to launch crude capsules, which is something that only Russia had the capability of doing after the US scraped its space shuttle program. All of this has led to the decline in fortunes of the Russian space industry, yet it could have been avoided if they gave Ellen a good deal on some ICBMs 20 years ago. Audie Murphy comes to mind. He was essentially Captain America before the super serum, undersized, weak. 5 feet 5 inches tall, 19, and did more than any comic book writer could imagine. He forged his birth certificate to get into the army. He was turned down by the army, navy, and marines due to him being underweight, but his persistence resulted in an army exception. He earned the Medal of Honor, Distinguished Service Cross, two Silver Stars, Legion of Merit, three Purple Hearts, two Bronze Stars, French Legion of Honor, Chevalier, French Croix de Goût with Silver Star, French Croix de Goût with Palm, 3, Belgium Croix de Goût, French for a Gay, Texas Legislative Medal of Honor. These are not even the entire list of his awards he earned. He was awarded every Medal of Valor possible in World War II including all French and Belgium medals for heroism. In the battle, where he was awarded the Medal of Honor, their tank destroyer was destroyed and caught fire. He was wounded and continued firing his M1 at the advancing enemy from a completely exposed position. 
he was wounded and fueled by what had to be supernatural power, mounted the flaming tank destroyer and grabbed its .50 calorie machine gun and stood there while an entire company fired on him as he emptied round after round at the oncoming Nazis. The Germans sent a squad crawling in a trench to take him out, but he saw them and mowed them all down. He was finally wounded in his legs, but kept firing until he completely ran out of ammunition. He killed or wounded over 50 Germans. He retreated back to his unit and refused medevac and personally led his unit back into combat to push the Germans back. He held off an entire company on his own. He became a famous actor after the war and producers and directors refused to make a film about his exploits as they felt that no one would ever believe it was real and were afraid it would damage the credibility of what he actually did. This citation was awarded to Audie Murphy for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity involving risk of life above and beyond the call of duty in action with the enemy, the 26th of January 1945. The citation reads. Second Lieutenant. Murphy commanded Company B, which was attacked by six tanks and waves of infantry. Second Lieutenant. Murphy ordered his men to withdraw to prepared positions in a woods, while he remained forward at his command post and continued to give fire directions to the artillery by telephone. Behind him, to his right, one of our tank destroyers received a direct hit and began to burn. Its crew withdrew to the woods second lieutenant. Murphy continued to direct artillery fire which killed large numbers of the advancing enemy infantry, with the enemy tanks abreast of his position, second lieutenant. Murphy climbed on the burning tank destroyer, which was in danger of blowing up at any moment, and employed its .50 caliber machine gun against the enemy. He was alone and exposed to German fire from three sides, but his deadly fire killed dozens of Germans and caused their infantry attack to waver. The enemy tanks, losing infantry support, began to fall back. For an hour the Germans tried every available weapon to eliminate second lieutenant. Murphy, but he continued to hold his position and wiped out a squad which was trying to creep up unnoticed on his right flank. Germans reached as close as 10 yards, only to be mowed down by his fire. He received a leg wound, but ignored it and continued the single-handed fight until his ammunition was exhausted. He then made his way to his company, refused medical attention, and organized the company in a counterattack which forced the Germans to withdraw. His directing of artillery fire wiped out many of the enemy, he killed or wounded about 52nd Lieutenant. Murphy's indomitable courage and his refusal to give an inch of ground saved his company from possible encirclement and destruction, and enabled it to hold the woods which had been the enemy's objective. Enter Yi Sunsin. Yi was one of the few incorruptible nobles in the Korean court, who actually did the military examination. He had grown in popularity after fortifying part of the northern border against raiders, only to be blamed for a defeat by a jealous superior who refused to supply Yi. Due to this, Yi had been demoted to a common soldier. After the defeat the previous admiral had, Yi was put in charge of rebuilding the navy and fighting the Japanese at sea, while the army was getting crushed on land. After a few notable victories such as the Battle of Busan, where Yi sunk 100 Japanese ships while they were too busy raiding Busan, he was put in charge of a province that he then turned into a production hub where he built the first of his new ship, the Turtle Ship. Later on, the Japanese decided that Yi was too big of a problem, despite winning literally everywhere but where Yi was, that they tried to lure him out by having a commander pretend to be betraying a rival and selling out the location of an unarmed transport fleet. When you saw through this and refused to act upon the letter, his enemies in court used it to have him beaten nearly to death and demoted to a common soldier. The man who replaced him the proceeded to lose the entire retty of Yi's newly rebuilt fleet by falling for the same trick that Yi refused to fall for. When the Korean court saw this, they put you back in command of the navy where he managed to assemble the remnants of his once great navy, now roughly 13 ships, and readied them to fight the Japanese fleet, numbering 330 ship. The Japanese chased Yi to the spot he wanted them, Myeong Nyang Strait. This strait was chosen by Yi due to his narrow it was, causing large fleets to have a hard time maneuvering around itself, and a strange property of the current, it changes directions every few hours. When the battle began, Yi's flagship charged in alone, 
because his other ships were paralyzed with fear. When they saw the havoc he caused, they joined him. Just at the Japanese vanguard, was turning to flee, and return to the safety of the fleet, the current turned and sent the unwieldy Japanese forces into each other. The Battle of Myeong Nang resulted in massive career victory with the Japanese losing more than 30 ships and suffering nearly 50% casualties and the Korean suffering only 2 dead and 3 wounded from heat stroke and 8 drowning. The victory resulted in the Japanese ceasing all offensive naval operations. In his last battle, a Chinese fleet had arrived to assist Yi in driving out the remainder of the Japanese. The Chinese admiral, unfamiliar with Yi's preferred way of naval combat, charged in blindly without a plan. When Yi moved in to assist, he was forced to partake in close combat, a form of combat that he had always tried to avoid. To keep up morale, Yi began to beat the war drum causing the Japanese to realize whose ship had come to assist the Chinese admiral and to focus on Yi's ship. During the fighting, Yi was shot and killed. His final words were the war is at its height, wear my armor, and beat my war drums. Do not announce my death. Well I'm not sure if it's the greatest, but definitely a personal favorite of mine, TLDR. A faking madman of a general during WW1 takes command of an infantry brigade after being disciplined and leads them into an artillery barrage to capture a major fortified city with his sword. And he did point the man who became German Field Marshal Ludendorff, whose commanding general was responsible for an absolutely time-critical and successful assault on a series of forts in Belgium that the entire German war plan was dependent on. When the assaults were bogged down, because running at entrenched heavy machine guns and presided artillery across open ground isn't easy, he left the general staff headquarters and took command of a brigade and seized the entire city by banging on the fort garrison door with a but of his sword after running through an artillery barrage to get there. So while the Germans were waiting for the siege guns to arrive, beginning on August 5 they mounted several ill-advised frontal assaults and quickly discovered the advantage enjoyed by well-entrenched defenders, the main, baleful lesson of the Great War. The Belgian garrisons, numbering around 40,000, had connected the forts with hastily dug trenches studded at intervals with machine guns, which along with massed rifle fire inflicted horrific casualties on German troops approaching in dense formation. One inhabitant of Liege, Paul Hermelius, recounted a night attack, the German storming parties marched up in thick lines, as steadily as if on parade, in the cold moonlight. The Belgian onlookers began to be anxious, lest the enemy should be allowed to come to near, when a single long report of mitrailleuses, machine guns, all firing together, sent them to the other world at a single puff. This was repeated time after time. People who went near the forts later on said they had seen the Germans lying in a heap, six and seven deep, wounded and killed mixed inextricably together, so numerous that their names and numbers could not possibly be collected. Later Germans and Belgians were heaped up separately, often in the trenches in which they had been fighting, and covered with quicklime, over which water was poured. Gladys Lloyd, an English woman traveling in Belgium, recorded this account from a young Belgian who'd been acting as a spy in Korea, back quote this morning I have just come from Liege. The German dead were piled up each side of my path, ghastly lolling corpses, one on the top of each other. He puts his hand up higher than his head, back quote it was the most awful sight I have ever seen, and then the odor. And the poor spy is literally sick in the village street. Impatient with this slow progress, on August 7 Erich Ludendorff a member of the general staff who was sent to the field, because of his difficult personality, and who would go on to become one of Germany army's most successful commanders staged a daring raid into Liege itself. After dashing into the city Ludendorff strode up to the gate of the citadel and simply knocked on the door with the butt of his sword, demanding its surrender, which he received. The fall of the citadel gave the Germans control of the town, including the all-important bridges across the Meuse, which the Belgians probably would have dynamited before withdrawing. Ludendorff's single-handed capture of the citadel quickly became a thing of legend, propelling him to the top of the short list of officers waiting for army commands. The field of cardiology has so much to thank this man. The first ever cardiac catheterization we give credit to Dr. Werner Forsman. Dr. Forsman proposed to reach the heart of man through the veins in the crease of the arm. Point Dr. Forsman elicited the help of Gerda Didson, a surgical nurse at August Victoria Home. 
In a month, Dr. Forsman had convinced her to be his first human guinea pig. Dr. Forsman, unbeknownst to Ditson, planned on experimenting on himself. She held the keys to the closet, which was needed to obtain a long enough catheter. As Nurse Ditson was strapped to the surgical table in the small operating room, sweating from both excitement and the sweltering heat, Dr. Forsman walked the distance of the oar and began his self-experimentation. Dr. Forsman identified a predominant vein and inserted the 65cm long ureteral tube into his arm, feeling progressive painless warmth as the tube coursed along. He had determined this was the only tube thin and long enough to safely and adequately reach the endocardium. However he still needed her help to conceal the tube hanging out of his arm. They went tube in place to the fluoroscopic x-ray facility where images were obtained in the hospital basement point the initial x-ray clearly indicated that the tube had not yet reached its destination. Dr. Forsman forced the tube farther, resisting at one point the overwhelming urge to cough when the tube collided against his vein. When the tube was shown to be in the right oracle Dr. Forsman had the technician snap the picture. Finally obtaining the proof that he needed, Dr. Forsman uneventfully removed the tube 